This uh, sermon today is actually taken from the Ten Commandments, and so it will be based on the introduction to the Ten Commandments, which is in Luther's large catechism, not the small catechism, but that's nonetheless, that's okay. Welcome. Welcome to court. Only this is not a normal courthouse, and whatever judgment is declared in this courtroom carries eternal consequence. The prosecutor is here. Only he is not an ordinary prosecutor, but he knows and keeps record of each and every sin of thought, word, and deed committed by the defendant. You are the defendant. You're the one. But you are no ordinary defendant. The accusations against you are as high as the stars are high and as wide and broad as the earth. Your defense attorney enters the room, but he is no ordinary defense attorney. While the prosecutor has piles upon piles of evidence against you, your attorney comes pretty empty-handed with only one small book. This makes you very queasy. You're pretty sure that you're in a lot of trouble. The bailiff cries from the midst of the courtroom, all rise, and the entire room stands at reverent attention. The prosecutor glares at you from the corner of his eye. In enters the judge. But he is no ordinary judge. Upon his desk are the words beginning and end, and upon his robe are inscribed, is inscribed the phrase righteous and true. This frightens you all the more, knowing that you may not live up to his standard. The judge turns to you and says, You are on trial before heaven, and your eternity will be decided. Are you prepared to defend yourself? Your attorney looks at you and turns to the judge and says, We are prepared. The judge turns to the prosecution, whose name is Darkness and the Father of Lies, and asks, Have you prepared your case against the defendant? The prosecutor slithers the words, I am prepared. The courtroom sits. The prosecution begins. The prosecutor points to you with such crassness that it seems his finger has reached in and chiseled through your heart. He says, this person, this thing you created, judge, has broken every law in the book. This animal, this ape, has not respected you, great judge, but has willfully worshipped his own inventions and bowed to the lusts of the world. This monster which you great judge, call your child, has used your name to hurt others and to lie to others, disregarded your words and treated your very existence as a fairy tale. He didn't even go to church, but skipped much of the time. And this wicked defendant has been very disobedient to all the authorities. You, great judge, demand be obeyed. The defendant has looked at other creatures in ways unfitting of one who is made in your image. This monstrosity has lied and stolen and cheated and coveted and hurt others and defiled others and in every single way possible has broken your great and mighty laws with impunity. Great Lord and judge of all, surely you see that this disgusting thing you once called your pinnacle of creation, which you hastily made in, as your representatives in the world, surely you see the unworthiness of it all. You cannot let this freak go free. You cannot let this beast to roam. The sentence must be death and damnation. For you are a just judge, and to do any different would simply be unjust. I rest my case. The judge turns to the defense. You, in a desperate attempt to, to make yourself look a little better before the judge, you stand up and you begin to plead with the judge, and you try to remind the judge of all the good things you've done. You begin to say to the judge, but I've gone to church sometimes. Yeah, I might have said a few unkind things and looked at others in bad ways and did a few bad things in my life, but, but I never killed anyone. No one ever got hurt, and you know, everyone else was doing it too. The judge slams his gavel on the desk. That's not a very good slam. He slams his gavel on the desk, and your attorney grabs you by the shoulder and holds you down and says to you, be at peace. You don't know how you could possibly be at peace. But in your soul, you know that every word the prosecutor said against you is true, and you didn't do a great job of convincing the judge otherwise. You have been disobedient. You've broken the law left and right, and without even giving it a second thought, 
You are a troubled child, and it's true that if the judge lets you off easy, you'll probably go right back to breaking the law all the more. And looking at your attorney, you've convinced yourself that it's over. Maybe it's best, you say to yourself. Maybe it's best that I be condemned. After all, where is the hope? That prosecutor's right. The judge turns to your attorney and says, make your defense. Your attorney stands and walks in front of the desk, standing directly in front of you. You see the prosecutor glaring at your attorney, waiting for his chance to pounce, and your attorney begins to speak. He says, oh, great judge, I know that you are mighty and that your judgment is true and good and just. All of the things that this prosecutor has said, all of it is true. Someone in this room has done great evil. Someone in this room has broken your laws. Someone in this room has treated you with disdain, has used your righteous name for gain, has squandered your words and your teachings, has murdered and hated your blessed creation, has looked at others with lust and desire, has taken from others for selfish gain, has lied about others and hurt others by way of gossip and slander and pride, has coveted and desired things more than you. O great and eternal judge, yes, it is true, someone in this room is guilty. The prosecutor is rubbing his blood-red hands together with such pressure that fire bursts from them. You, out of great fear, won't even look at the judge, but you look down at the table, shivering. You wonder what's, what sort of defense this is, and it seems as though no one is on your side, not even your own attorney. But then something happens, something unexpected. Your attorney says something that cannot be explained. Great and mighty judge of the living and the dead, he says. The guilty one in this room is. You feel as though you're about to burst. Your hands are shaking and sweating. The guilty one in this room is not the person sitting behind me. You freeze. Your attorney turns to you and whispers, Now be quiet. It'll be okay. Turning back to the judge, your attorney says, the guilty one in this room is me. I am the one. Suddenly, it is as if a great weight is lifted from your shoulders. What did he say? You tug on your attorney's shirt with angst and begin to say to him, but sir, I, I did these things. Your attorney turns to you and says to your face, quiet now. It is finished. You're free. The prosecutor screams and demands that the judge strike your attorney's words from the book, but the judge says no. He slams the great gavel down upon the desk. The bailiff removes your change and says to you, go, you're free. And as you leave the court, you see from the corner of your eye your attorney being dragged away, flogged, beaten, and nailed to a cross to die. Blood and water flow from his side, and they lay him in a tomb. This is the true story of you and me. For just as an earthly law such as speed limit 60 miles an hour is not a suggestion, God's law is not a suggestion. God's law condemns us. As the Lord proclaims through the prophet Isaiah, our righteous deeds, in other words, our attempts to be righteous before God are as filthy rags. We can't, and we shouldn't look at these Ten Commandments and pridefully say, See, I've kept many of them today, or I've kept the fifth commandment all my life. For just as the rich young man walked away from Jesus condemned, we too walk away condemned whenever we believe our law-keeping, our goodness, our piety, our outward acts or works are enough to save us. Or that God is somehow satisfied with our not-so-perfect attempts at being good. You can be a world-famous Christian whom everyone think is godly and good and righteous and holy. You can walk into this church and the people marvel at your righteousness and your graciousness and still find yourself on a downward path to hell. None of us are righteous in and of ourselves or by our works or by our deeds. And we ought not judge each other, good or evil, by them either. Again, Isaiah 64, we have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment, or a better translated way of saying it is, our righteousness is like a polluted garment. Even the good that we do is not good enough. See, the law of God, these Ten Commandments, which we're about to recite, they do not gauge how good we are, but how evil we are, 
how we break God's standard of perfection. His law leaves us broken and empty and with nothing. We cannot in any amount earn our way to God because we are penniless. We are broke. The bank account of your righteousness is empty. The law of God shows you the truth, shows you the reality of your sin, and that there is nothing you can do to change it. Yeah, it's devastating to our self-esteem. It's devastating to our egos, but it's the truth. And as St. John reminds us, and as we recite every Sunday we do the divine service, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But the good news is that the trial is ended. The devil and all his powers of condemnation, his accusations, his insults, and his demand for your death, it doesn't matter anymore. See, Jesus stepped out in front of you. He took the blame, all of it. He faced every accusation, every insult, and he died so that you might be set free forever. God doesn't need your help or your assistance. He doesn't need you to show him how good that you've been or how good you are with your life. He doesn't need you to give excuses for your sins of thought, word, and deed. He doesn't need any of that. He sent his only son who lived in perfect obedience to his holy law. And in spite of his innocence and his righteousness, he took your blame and punishment into himself. He died and he was laid in the tomb. And because of this, you get freedom. No sin is counted against you, not one. You are covered in the righteousness of Christ, clothed by a once-for-all sacrifice of righteous blood. You are eternally wrapped up in God, and there is no accusation, no threat left against you. The devil's empty words are meaningless. He cannot harm you or take you away from the Lord. Yes, you are a sinner, but yes, Christ Jesus has died, and your sins are not counted against you. So knowing this, why do we still study the commandments? And why do we confess our sins? Well, we study the, and learn the commandments for two reasons. First, so that we do not forget that we are sinful people, be, become filled with pride and become enslaved again to unrighteousness. When we remember that we are sinful people and we acknowledge that we are sinful people, we are less apt to trust in ourselves and our own works, but instead we continue to trust in the mercies of Christ. And you see this play out. When people, when churches start to redefine sin and say that this action isn't sin or that lifestyle isn't sinful, little by little the object of faith changes and the people start trusting in themselves. As Solomon the wise proclaims, there's nothing new under the sun. When humans stop acknowledging their sin, they start down the path of apostasy. Second, we study the law and learn the commandments because as Christians, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. The law shows us and guides us in God-loving and neighbor-loving. How do we love God? We love God by seeking Him and him alone as our Lord, and fleeing from the love of money, of possessions, of fame, and the like. We love God by using and learning his word properly and being faithful in our prayer and in our worship. We love God by listening to his prophets and having a willingness to be instructed and corrected and admonished and rebuked for the sake of what is best and what is right, and at the same time we love God by fleeing from false teaching and the lies of the devil. How do we love our neighbor? We love our neighbor by protecting his possessions and wealth. We love our neighbor by uplifting him and protecting his reputation and putting the best construction on all things concerning him. We love our neighbor by respecting her body. We love our neighbor by protecting his life and helping him to be prosperous. And with the help of God's Holy Spirit, these commandments teach us, they guide us into how we should live the Christian life. Finally, if our sins are truly forgiven, as, and they are, why is it necessary to confess our sins every week or every day? Well, it is true that our sins are forgiven. In Christ who died, God has laid upon him all our iniquities. They're gone. But as frail human beings living in a sinful world and existing in these bodies that suffer from the effects of sin and from guilt and from despair and from hurt and from pain, 
this sinful nature is still very much with us. And in spite of the fact that we are no longer judged as sinners in God's courtroom and that we are 100% saints, we still sin. We confess our sins and live lives of contrition so that we do not fall back into the trap of pride or self-righteousness. Confession keeps us humble and it keeps our minds and our hearts focused on Jesus. The pastor speaks the words of the absolution not because I possess magic powers. No, the pastor forgives the sins of the people in the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit first because Jesus gives the pastor through the church the authority and the command to do it. Jesus says, if you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. Jesus gives this authority to his church and the pastor speaks the words of absolution so that you receive through your ears the comfort and the assurance of forgiveness rather than trying to look into yourself to find that comfort. I forgive you all your sins, first, because you are a sinner, and second, because I am commanded to do it by Christ himself, and third, because I don't want any of you to leave this place thinking that God has not forgiven you of your sins. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. By faith, believing that Christ Jesus has suffered and died and taken your sins to death on the cross, you are free. This is the life and the breath and the substance and the whole purpose of the church to proclaim repentance and forgiveness of sins, law and gospel. In other words, proclaim it to the world. By God's grace, may we continue to do this with boldness and without apology. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. If you turn to your bulletins, you will see listed in your bulletins the Ten Commandments, and we will recite these Ten Commandments at this time together. We begin. You shall have no other gods. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. We rise for the Te Deum. <laughs> 